Okay, beyond exploratory analysis, we're going to start talking about how we can communicate our results and communicate our science really effectively. I want to start with a set of examples um, looking at the loss of sea ice. So this first plot here um, is really data dense. And there's a lot of extra stuff in here that could be edited out. Like we don't need every single year, but it's very explicit. Maybe we do need every single year because we've got a value. So the bars are the volume of ice that's um, remaining at the end of the season when ice is at its minimum. So the blue line is the yearly ice maximum. So the maximum volume every year. And the red is the calculated ice loss every year and then the ice remaining at the yearly minimum um, as a volume. So there's a ton of information here. Um, we've got trend lines, we've got um, the um, minimum amount of ice remaining at the end of every season, um, labeled specifically, um, very data rich, and showing a trend over time. The second plot, this is a radar plot, um, is just showing um, well, pretty much the same information. So we've got volume again is on the axis here, and then we've got time rotating around. So from 1979, rotating around to 2013, and each line is a month. And the calculated volume of ice um, average per month um, over the course of these years. And so if we just pick, for example, April, because it's here at the outset, We've got, um, you know, 30, you know, four maybe, um, 34,000 cubic kilometers of ice. And over time, we can see that not super effectively because um, it's rotating around a circle, but by the end, uh, at 2012, our last measurement, it's dropped to about 22,000 square or cubic uh, kilometers. So that's how you read a radar plot. Um, you know, the colors are a little bit funky, but um, they are at least distinct. Okay, same kind of idea here, but this one's really interesting. Look at, look at how this is set up. We've got axes on all four sides of this plot. Here's the center. So what this is showing is ice volume, 0, 10, 20, 30, same units, I believe. It's uh, thousands of uh, cubic kilometers. And um, time is wrapping as one line, changing from the earliest in yellow, or sorry, the earliest in the dark purples to the most recent in yellow. So again, it's starting here, and it looks like these are all every month. So it's a continuous, um, a continuous line. So instead of having um, monthly sums like we did here, we're just saying on a daily um, basis, wrapping around, but we shift um, axes as we rotate around. And so it, it kind of summarizes that this is spring. Uh, let's see here, 10, 20, 30. Yeah, so this would be starting in January, moving through to spring, summer, fall. So you can see it's the most compressed here. We only go to 20 because we have our minimums, our uh, ice volume minimums in the autumn, and then building back up to our max again out here. These are our highest values. But over time, we see it, uh, the circle is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. This one has, uh, this is just a really funky plot. Um, we know enough to know that if time is gonna be uh, related like this, that the colors should be sequential, not categorical. And then in addition to every color, they've made it a little bit more colorblind safe by putting different um, symbols at the end or marking each point, but they're stacked on top of each other. And cognitively, this is a terrible way to display this data. But let's set that aside. We've got a mean from uh, 1979 to 2016 plotted in this line. And then just the most recent, what, seven or eight years plotted here uh, with the beginnings of 2017 um, showing how far below the mean this is as a trend. And then this guy, this is a beautiful plot. So what's happening here is we're using a combination of annotations, highlighting, 
um, redundant encoding. So, uh, you know, months are on the uh, x-axis here, but we're summarizing summer to show that in the late summer, fall is where we have the ice minimums and the ice maximums in the winter time. Um, you know, people can discern that, you know, December, January, February is winter, but redundantly encoded, that's great. Same here, volume. Uh, here we're talking about ice surface, I guess, uh, ice cover, so it's square kilometers, but they're throwing in some extra labels. The size of California is how big um, this is. <laughs> the size of Alaska comes in here. Canada comes in around um, 10 million square kilometers. So that's kind of a, a cool way of showing it. It makes it a little bit more human, right? Um, annotations in bold and in color with labels, um, the annotations uh, matching the lines. This is really smart. I think this author is saying, this is what I want you to take home from this. I want you to notice this line. I'm gonna summarize this for you. Really well done. We can go pure visual and just show pictures. So in September of 1979, this is our ice coverage, and in September 2007. Um, we can get emotional. This is an artist named Jill Pelto. Um, she plots um, variables and then creates art around them. Um, actually, hang on, I'm going to show you a couple others really quick. So this is a painting that she did um, mapping global temperature rise. She lives in Washington State and was really being um, impacted by the wildfires that were raging there. Um, uh, yeah, so she plots increase in global temperature against, you know, a painting that's kind of telling a different story. Um, she's got, um, let's see here, this one's really famous. It, it has um, global sea ice volumes, um, not sea ice, uh, glacier decrease, sea level rise increase. Obviously, the scales are very different. Um, Global temperature, I think, increasing here, and then carbon dioxide emissions or something like that. Um, anyway, she's worth looking up. Jill Pelto, just an interesting way of, of visualizing the information. Okay, um, other ways, you know, just purely emotional. And then uh, this one, <laughs> we, we've talked a lot about plotting, and we've talked about volume, and we've talked about, you know, 3D, and we've talked about... Um, you know, redundant things like making this a three-dimensional line, um, tipping the whole thing and adding perspective. But, you know, there's something to be said for this also. You know, it's, it's catchy. We're talking about a volume of ice that's being decreased, and that is a hard thing for people to visualize. So maybe this is realistic. It's labeled with the exact numbers if, if people are uh, more, you know, akin to extracting information that way. But anyway, you know, 10 different ways to visualize sea ice loss. And, um, you know, it's all about your audience and, and how you're trying to communicate the information. So just to recap, visualization for exploration is for you. It's about fast um, visualization, decoding um, tables of information. You want to rapidly generate visualizations. You're not going to take time to embellish or label or um, symbolize things. You're just trying to get a sense of um, what the data looks like. But when we're talking about visualization for communication, you definitely want a strong title, definitely want annotations, highlights, arrows, just like I showed you in that um, one of the last plots. Redundant encodings, nothing wrong with that. It helps make the message easier to um, ingest. Pictograms, explanations including captions, legends, etc. So let's run through the 10 simple rules for effective visualizations as a recap. I want you to notice how many of them have to do with communicating and the final product. Number one, know your, know your audience. Everything on these slides is really important. I'm going to go through it fast, but um, take time to ingest these if you need to pause. Um, audience affects how much detail you're going to include in your plot. Are you working with collaborators that know the background? Um, students, scientific journals, the general public. Each one of those is gonna require a different depth of context. Okay, rule number two, have a clear um, identity for your message. What is the purpose of the figure? To express an idea or results that would be near impossible to explain with only words, what's your underlying message? 
And how can your figure best express that message? Remember that the message has to drive the design. Okay, it's function over form all the time. Okay, this one, don't trust the defaults. We've talked about that. Rule number four, use color wisely and effectively. We've talked about that. Rule five, don't lie, be objective, be transparent. Six, avoid cart, uh, chart junk, including uh, you know, data ink ratio, data density, and all those things we've talked about. No decorations. Rule seven, captions are not optional. This is really important for your final projects, okay? You're gonna want arrows, you're gonna want annotations, you're gonna want really smart labels. Um, you do have to include some kind of a caption. That's where you're gonna explain how to read the figure, what order to take it in, which is redundant encoding for the hierarchy, right? Um, provide specifics or precision that isn't graphically represented. You can make points of interest visually distinct, but you can also point things out in a caption. Just flat out use words to tell your audience what you want them to see and take home. Okay, rule eight, adapt the figure to support the medium. This is really important for your final projects too. Are you creating a poster that could be printed at three by four feet? Is it gonna be displayed on a computer screen? Is it gonna be interactive? Is it a PowerPoint presentation that you're gonna be able to walk through and use animations to unfold the information as you want it to appear? Is it going to be static in print? Each implies a different viewing and interacting format. Will it be standing alone? Um, are you going to be standing there to point out key elements, right? All of this impacts the level of detail, line weight, font size, contrast between all of the elements that are going into your final Product. Are you going to be looking at each plot at the same time? And so do you need one of them to stand out more than the other? Or will your audience be taking your plots in one at a time? So the relationships need to be built a different way. Okay, rule nine, message trumps beauty. This is always, um, um, yeah, important. You might be thinking about inventing a new kind of graphic style to display your results. Just be really careful, okay? Don't go too crazy. I'm gonna talk about that in the next set of slides. And number 10, get the right tool. You have a wide variety of tools in your quiver. ArcMap, Tableau, Excel, PowerPoint, Paint, Illustrator, Google. Don't limit yourself, okay? You can start something in ArcMap. You can export things and work with them in other um, software packages. You can start in Tableau, finish somewhere else, work in Excel to clean up your data, etc. So you're not limited to one tool from the exploratory to the explanatory. Okay, a couple of quick examples. This is a descriptive title, the kind of title that is generated automatically sometimes for you, um, or is just the easiest thing to do because it's basically describing your, your axes. Percentage of uninsured Americans. Wah, wah. America's uninsured rate dips below 10%. There's a story. You're telling your audience what to focus on, you're creating some interest. You can actually say the percent of uninsured people in the U.S. as a subtitle or as a caption or um, as an annotation. These two are redundant. Don't do that. Okay, investment by area of impact. Same thing. The title is descriptive but not very interesting. Totally lacks insight. It's up to your audience to ingest this thing on their own. The x-axis is hard to read because it's tipped. There's no order to the data. Units for the y-axis, totally missing. Background, mock. Bars are too wide and really weak text hierarchy. Here's a rework. We invest primarily in four areas. This is the same data with a, an interesting little subtitle. Since we began investing in 2006, four areas have received more than $600,000 each, accounting for 75% of total grant making activity. Huge summary happening here. And then here's the information and the data to back that up. Investment by area of impact, same title as before. Units, great organization, highlighting a subset, easy to read, direct labels, no axes, super clean storytelling, okay? 